In the early 1990s, all Windows computers came with a development environment for the BASIC language. At that point, BASIC didn't yet support object-oriented programming, but it did come with some example programs. My first encounter with a professionally written program was with a game written in BASIC called Nibbles. It's a variation on the Snake game, and you can see the code right now. It's just one long file. Why not write programs in one long file? Let's say you and I are working on a program together. And you go first. It's only in one file, so you take the file and you add all kinds of cool stuff to it. And then after hours of work, you got the program running, looks great, I'm going to add an extra few features. First thing I do is change one of the lines at the top of the program, and it no longer works. That's the kind of thing we want to avoid. And we can do that with object-oriented programming. You work on your classes, I work on mine, they're contained in different files, and then we won't have this problem, in theory. Now the question is, that's object-oriented programming, what's this object-oriented design business? Well really what we're talking about is the process of making decisions so that we maximize what we get out of our object-oriented programming. When we're talking about object-oriented design, four words show up a lot. Abstraction, encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. Abstraction. Let's say you wanted to make an object that represented a tree. So what properties does a tree have? It has bark and it has maybe rings on the inside of the tree and a bird's nest where the bottom branch meets the trunk. The point I'm trying to make is that we don't actually need all the details. Our program will have an object that represents the tree, but it only needs to know that there's maybe a trunk and some green leaves, and that's it. That way we can abstract out just the details we want, just the variables and just the responsibilities that that class needs to have in order to function as a tree in our program without all the infinitely many details that we can find in real life. Encapsulation. The following two pictures come from an article about clean architecture. The link is at the bottom of the screen. For our purposes, we're going to focus on encapsulation. Looking at this picture, you can see many different office supplies, all connected by some string. The office supplies represent parts of your program, the string, how they interact with each other. Let's say you want to replace the scissors. So the scissors represent some code, you want to replace it with something else. From this picture, it's not obvious what the scissors part of the code actually interacts with. So if you just go and replace the scissors with something else, this might interrupt the functioning of other parts of the program. Now let's consider the second picture. So this is what the code looks like after we've done some refactoring, we implemented a different design, and so now we have a nicely organized program where we can tell what the scissors are interacting with. They're interacting with the post-it notes. And so that way we know if we replace the code for the scissors, we might have to look at the post-it note part of the code just to make sure it still runs, but the rest of the program is doing just fine. It doesn't have to be changed just because we replaced the scissors part of the code. That's what encapsulation does. It allows us to work with one part of the code and the rest of the program still runs properly. Inheritance. Let's implement a class called vehicle. We can only give it properties that are common to all vehicles, or at least all the vehicles we want to consider in our program. So we're only looking at the things that a vehicle can do regardless of its type. That way, when we do implement various types of vehicles, they can inherit all of this code. So our class vehicle is specifically a place to put all the code that we want each and every one of our specific vehicle classes to have. Polymorphism. Here we have a scooter. It's a type of vehicle, which means if we have a scooter class in our program, it can extend vehicle and inherit all those lovely methods that we put in the vehicle class to begin with. Now we can create instances of our vehicle that are specifically scooters. 
since they're also type vehicle, we can put them in an array list of vehicles. So here we see some Java code that creates a fleet of vehicles and then adds our scooter to that fleet. So where does polymorphism come in? Well, poly means many and morphism has to do with forms. So if you have an object that is both a vehicle and a scooter, it can take on the form of a vehicle. It can use all of those methods that we put in the vehicle class. Whereas if it's taking on the form of a scooter, that means it's specifically doing things that only a scooter would do and maybe not other types of vehicles. Here we see both happening because V is a vehicle, but it's also a scooter. So when we call it stop method, the actual implementation will be specific to how scooters stop. So why do we bother with object-oriented design? The short answer is because it makes it easier for us to work with each other. The longer answer is this. We want to create a program that is easy to read with the right amount of comments, hard to break so when someone else uses your code they don't do something wrong, testable, in other words you can test all the different parts of the code easily, extensible in the sense that we can add new things to the code without actually having to rewrite anything. Maintainable, so that as life happens and things need upgrading or updating, it doesn't take too long to do that for your program. And efficient, and in particular efficient for all the humans involved, so that nobody is wasting time and doing unnecessary tasks Everything was designed to make it as quick and easy as possible to write, maintain, and add anything you need to to your program. So these are our goals. This is why we do object-oriented design. Welcome.